So good morning everybody and uh, welcome. So uh, you may be knowing that uh, last week, that is uh, from Monday to Friday, we had this very exciting uh, conference in Bangalore, Strings 2015, which was organized by the International <coughs> Center for Theoretical Sciences of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bangalore. Uh, one of our missions is to have a very strong public outreach uh, in which we would like to inform uh, students <coughs> and other members of civic society about the exciting and fascinating developments of science. So taking the opportunity that uh, very distinguished people were visiting us from various parts of the world and India, uh, we thought of putting this program together uh, this public program today uh, and we have divided it into two parts. One is the interactive session with students uh, <clears throat> called Fundamental Interactions and uh, for which we have uh, two very distinguished uh, physicists on the stage, uh, Nima Arkani Hamid and Ashok Sen. And uh, there's an afternoon session uh, of public lectures with uh, Nathan Zyberg, Andy Strominger, and Cameron Waffa. So uh, with these very few words, and a welcome again to all of you, I'd like to first ask all of you to come forward, because it's an interactive session. So please do come forward, actually, from, especially from the back over here, so that you can interact more easily with the people on the dice. Please, please come. Come forward. Leave the front row empty, but uh, occupy the rest. And now I'd like to invite uh, Rajesh Gopakumar to conduct this uh, proceed, proceedings and uh, introduce the speakers and uh, <coughs> take charge of this event, yeah. Hello and uh, welcome uh, on this uh, Saturday morning to, uh, so I'm, I, I'm very excited actually to uh, uh, to welcome you all to this uh, session that we've called Fundamental Interactions. It's a rather novel experiment that we are trying out. Uh, and uh, so I just want to explain to you a little bit about the thinking behind it. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, I, I think, uh, so all of us who do science uh, today, we all started off as uh, students like you uh, who are enthused about, uh, uh, about science. And, uh, and surely as students, I know from personal experience uh, that, you, that one has lots and lots of questions about science, about uh, the science itself, what's happening, what's, uh, there are many exciting notions that you read about, and you have a lot of questions about them. Uh, you have questions about the nature of the scientific endeavor itself, what directions it's going to, uh, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what are the things that people find as the challenging uh, problems, and then you, uh, you're also very curious about the scientist's own experience uh, as a researcher in this quest uh, to understand more. Uh, of course, so uh, with all these questions as students, of course, you, are, uh, you might can look at books or the internet or whatever and, and get some, uh, get, get, uh, try to get some answers, but I think nothing really beats a direct one-to-one -one interaction with, uh, uh, with some top-notch scientist. So, uh, so that's what we've tried to do today. Uh, and um, uh, so we have two really utterly top-notch uh, physicists uh, today who uh, very kindly agreed to sort of take your questions. Uh, um, and uh, so your questions about 
about uh, particle physics, the LHC, and uh, cosmology, about black holes, string theory, uh, all of it. Just, just go ahead and ask. And, uh, uh, and, and so, uh, so, in that, uh, so the success of this experiment depends crucially on you people, uh, how, uh, uh, how actively you will question uh, them. But uh, to set the frame of these interactions, uh, we will have them both give uh, two brief introductory talks uh, uh, about various issues uh, uh, in, uh, in fundamental physics. And after that, the floor will be open to, uh, uh, to all of you. Uh, so first off, we have Nima. Uh, so let me just say a few words uh, to you by way of introduction. Uh, of course, you have a bio and everything, but I, I, I mean, I just wanted to give you a sense of things that, you, uh, that, are, uh, that are not there in the bio. Uh, I, Nima is a broad theoretical physicist in a very broad sense. Uh, he, uh, he sort of, uh, his ideas come from various uh, aspects of theoretical physics and mathematics, uh, but, uh, but in another sense, sense, uh, he's really a high energy physicist. And as you will see, he's really high energy when you see him on the stage uh, 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 very soon. Uh, and, um, uh, and so that's, I think, uh, that makes him the perfect person, I think, uh, uh, for you to uh, interact with. And um, uh, in physics, he's brought his, this unique energy to sort of churn a somewhat dormant the ideas in particle phenomenology in the last decade and a half or so, uh, Nima has uh, sort of churned the subject up really in, uh, by introducing a, a slew of uh, amazingly creative ideas, uh, and uh, uh, which, uh, which are going, many of which are going to be tested in the LHC in the coming months and years. Uh, and um, uh, uh, but um, uh, so so you'll hear from Nima so about some of the challenges there. His title is. Observe and calculate, uh, or calculate and observe, uh, and, and uh, so he will tell you about that. Uh, but before I just uh, bring him on stage, I just want to just tell you some of the bare facts. He's uh, he did his PhD at Berkeley and uh, was a professor at Harvard before joining the Institute for Advanced Study, where he is currently a uh, permanent faculty member, uh, and he's the recipient of several uh, uh, several awards like the Gribov. Medal of the European Physical Society, the Sackler Prize, the inaugural Fundamental Physics Prize, uh, and uh, for his remarkable teaching abilities, he is the recipient of the Phi Beta Kappa Award. Uh, so behold, Nima. So. Well, it's really fantastic to be here. It's wonderful to see all of you, and hopefully we'll have a lot of fun. Um, so. It, it's really tremendous fun uh, um, to be talking about uh, this subject uh, because fundamental physics today is in a really interesting place. Um, uh, on the one hand, uh, we're building off an incredible theoretical and experimental foundation uh, in, uh, uh, that was established over the 20th century for how the world works. Um, so we have an amazing foundation to a build off. Uh, on the other hand, we're confronting now in the 21st century uh, uh, qualitatively new kinds of questions, really big questions, huge questions, um, questions that uh, many of us feel are going to need really radical revolutionary ideas in order to uh, take us to the next step. And so since it's uh, you guys and the people of your generation who are going to have to take such steps, uh, it's fun to, um, uh, to uh, talk about what, uh, where we are at a very broad brush. So that's what I'm going to try to do uh, quickly in the next um, uh, 20 minutes. Um, so. Given the time, I have to compress uh, a lot of what we understand about physics, but I want to tell you enough about it so you have some concrete idea of what, what the issues are. So here's a summary of what we learned in the 20th century. Um, we had two big revolutions, the, rel the revolutions of relativity and quantum mechanics, and, uh, uh, and one amazing fact about uh, these discoveries, which is not widely appreciated, uh, is that the fact that the universe is described both by the laws of relativity and quantum mechanics 
brings a certain rigidity and inevitability to the structure of what the laws of physics can look like, at least at sufficiently large distances, such that just knowing these two broad principles of, of relativity and quantum mechanics is largely enough to tell us what the universe could possibly have looked like. And what the world actually looks like is, is exactly along the lines of, uh, of what these ideas would, would lead you to, to expect. So that's on the one hand, these two big ideas of space-time uh, uh, Einstein's space-time and quantum mechanics make the structure of the universe inevitable. Um, on the other hand, the main dramas of the 21st century have to do with the fact that both of these ideas, uh, uh, certainly one of them and perhaps both of them, uh, are, uh, are going to be questioned. So we have very good reasons to, to suspect that, uh, that space-time doesn't really exist because of uh, um, conflicts between uh, quantum mechanics and gravity at very short distances. We may even encounter limitations of quantum mechanics when we talk about very subtle questions having to do with applying quantum mechanics to the entire universe and cosmology. So that's, that's very striking because these are the two big ideas, space-time and quantum mechanics, that go into this spectacularly successful picture that we have. So the fact that there seems to be tensions with them and we may have to replace them with something else shows you the magnitude of the drama of the question involved. And there's a second set of questions uh, which is that, amazingly, after all of this time, these 2,000 years or 400 years that we've been understanding and uh, probing and explaining the way the world works, there's an incredibly basic question, one of the most basic facts about the world that we see around us, that it's large, it's big. Um, it's large and big and has big things in it. The fact that we have a macroscopic universe is something that we do not have a good explanation for today. <laughs> We have some explanation for it, which is lousy. It's so lousy that it makes us think that, that we're missing some very big principles. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's when you know great things are afoot. Uh, in the history of physics, uh, the biggest developments have been triggered by very simple questions, not details about some disagreement between theory and experiment in the sixth decimal place, but really big questions that you can explain to anybody. <laughs> And so that's what I'm going to try to do briefly, is at least explain uh, what, uh, what um, uh, some of these uh, uh, questions are. Maybe we'll get to more of them in the discussion session. Um, uh, but the questions are very easy to explain. Of course, it's a very big challenge to actually make some uh, progress on them. OK. Uh, but I think what I'll start off doing is, um, uh, is explaining a little bit, uh, so you have some context. Uh, about the first statement, that relativity and quantum mechanics makes the structure of the universe inevitable. This is such an amazing fact, and it's so underappreciated, that I do want to spend a little bit of time, I'm not going to be able to explain it in any detail, but I want to spend a little bit of time at least explaining to you uh, what I mean by this precisely. Um, so, uh, so, as I said, we discovered relativity and quantum mechanics, and there's a theoretical framework that was developed uh, starting in the 1930s, but really took a good 40, 50 years to uh, develop and understand properly, that allows us to describe physics in a way that's compatible with both of these two big principles. That theoretical framework is known as quantum field theory, uh, and it's something that we continue to learn more and more about as uh, time goes on. Um, it's an incredibly rich thing, uh, and which we really don't, don't fully understand. <clears throat> Now, one feature, one thing that we learned is that everything in nature, all the interactions, all the particles, all the interactions, everything we see around us in nature is ultimately the consequence of incredibly simple interactions uh, between elementary particles. So the force of electromagnetism is associated with this little stick figure interaction between two electrons and a photon. Uh, uh, the force of gravity is associated with the stick figure interaction between two uh, electrons and a graviton. Uh, and if two electrons are repelling each other, if you bang them off each other and they, uh, and they, and they, uh, and they scatter off each other by repelling, that's just uh, the consequence of putting two of these basic interactions together. And in fact, we can put all of these basic interactions together in every possible way, and that gives us every possible thing that actually uh, happens in the world around us. So there's a stunning simplicity that everything can be reduced to this most basic kind of elementary interaction. Now, the... the uh, electromagnetic and the gravitational force were known about for since uh, even to the ancients. In the early part of the 20th century, we discovered additional interactions that really only show up at very short distances, the strong interactions, the weak interactions. 
And uh, a big part of this triumph that I'm referring to that took a long time, really till the 1960s or 1970s to realize, is that these seemingly incredibly different interactions are ultimately described in exactly the same way once you go to sufficiently short distances. Okay? So this was not obvious at long distances, it was hidden, but once you go to sufficiently short distances, and quantum in quantum mechanics that means you have to go to very high energies, when we go to very high energies we see that these strong interactions that keep the quarks and gluons uh, inside uh, the protons and, and uh, neutrons that, uh, that, that, that they compose are associated with exactly the same kind of stick figure interaction. Similarly for uh, the other interactions. <clears throat> OK, so there's one more feature that, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a property of elementary particles. They have a, they have a spin. So uh, the electron can be thought of as a little spinning top. Um, and, it has a, and it has an angular momentum, which is one half in units of Planck's constant. Uh, the W boson is the particle that mediates the weak interactions, a massive particle that mediates the weak interactions. Um, we didn't notice the weak interactions for a long time uh, because it was a massive particle. So its effects were very small uh, at large distances and times, but eventually we discovered that, 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 that it was there. Um, so that massive particle has a spin one in units of Planck's constant. The photon has spin one. The graviton has spin two. And that's it. That's all we see. Whereas just the laws of quantum mechanics by themselves would allow you any multiple of one half in units of h bar. Okay, so, so the interactions we see are incredibly simple, and the spins of the particles that we see are incredibly simple. Okay? So, and in fact, there's a particular menu. There's a menu of elementary particles with a variety of spins. Um, and they all interact in this basic stick figure way. This menu is known as the standard model of particle physics. It's not the simplest thing in the world, but it's not terribly complicated. We, don't, we have some number of species of various kinds uh, which enjoy interactions of this sort. And what was accomplished by the uh, 1960s was the realization that this picture describes, is the quantum field theory that describes our physical universe. All interactions and everything that we know up to distances around 100 times smaller than the atomic nucleus. So one question you can ask is, why did it end up being so simple? Are we just lucky? Why is it that, uh, that, that we had such an amazingly simple structure? And just, just to contrast what it could have looked like, um, it could have been that uh, the fundamental interactions weren't just three things coming together. I mean, that's the simplest possible interaction you could have, is three things coming together at a point in space and time. Why didn't we have these much more complicated interactions with you know, 12 particles coming together in one spot? If that happened, it would have been terrible because we wouldn't be able to describe more complicated interactions in terms of just putting together sequences of much simpler ones. Okay? But that's not what happened. We don't have fundamental interactions that look like that. They all look like that. And another question you can ask is, why do we have such a tiny menu of possible spins? You know, why, why don't we have particles of spin 99 and uh, fundamental particles of spin 99 and other things like that lying around? And this is the more precise version of uh, the statement I, I said at the beginning, that relativity and quantum mechanics makes the universe inevitable. <clears throat> and so here's the statement. Uh, let's say you handed a bunch of sufficiently competent theoretical physicists the basic laws of relativity and quantum mechanics. And you locked them up in a room. You didn't let them look at the world outside. Okay? It's a little hard to imagine because they're, the, they're, they're in the world, in a room in the world. But anyway, you close the windows. They don't get to look at the world outside. You just hand them the basic laws of relativity and quantum mechanics. And you ask them, what could the world possibly look like compatible with these principles? Okay? Invent every conceivable universe compatible with these principles. While they would go away, they'd think for a long time, they'd, they would, uh, they would uh, make a lot of graduate students work very hard, uh, and they would come back with the following amazing answer. Uh, <clears throat> they would say that at long enough distances, no matter what's going on, no matter what the fundamental theory is, if we go to low enough energies or long enough distances, uh, all you'll see are particles interacting with a little stick figure, like that, little three-pronged stick figure. They would predict this. Okay? And that the only allowed spins you could have are particles of spin 0, 1 half, 1, 3 halves, and 2. That's it. <clears throat> and in fact, they would look and they'd say that spin 2 guy, for example, is unique. It's completely unique. There's only one particle like that you can possibly have. And it has to do strange things. Uh, if it acts on massive particles, it makes them go around in orbits. It's gravity, right? They've never seen, they haven't looked out the window. They don't know that there's apples falling and things like that. 
This is a consequence, it's one of the consequences, one of the consistent possibilities with relativity and quantum mechanics. Okay, so we've seen that guy. And then these spin one guys have rather constrained properties. The spin half guys, you can have any number of them that you want, but again, the properties are, the nature of these stick figure interactions are, are largely determined. <clears throat> so this is the menu that's allowed. And what I'm highlighting is the particles, the familiar particles that we know and love. There's gravity, the graviton is spin two. These are particles like the photon of the W spin one, electrons and so on of spin a half. So we are in a situation uh, where there are some set of things nature could do compatible with the general principles, but we haven't seen it do all of them. Okay? So nature seemed to only be using a subset of, of, of the principles. <clears throat> so we had not seen particles of spin zero or particles of spin three halves. Okay? Okay, now, <clears throat> so that was largely set uh, uh, for a long time and understood for a long time. But of course, many of you have heard the, the excitement of uh, uh, now, a couple of years ago, the discovery of the Higgs particle. So what is the Higgs all about, and how does it fit into this uh, general picture? Well, there's only one small amount of fine print that I didn't tell you about in the previous argument. Remember I told you it's when you go to sufficiently long distances, uh, uh, this has got to be true. Well, we've learned that in order to discover the main simplicity, uh, how the laws of nature really work, we should go to very short distances or very, very high energies. Okay? And the naive idea is that when you go to very high energies, the masses of the particles can be neglected. You can forget about the fact of the particles of a mass, right? Their, their energy is so much larger than mc squared that it should largely be irrelevant in how they interact. And what gives you that tiny menu of spins and those possibilities is the assumption that the particles are massless in some approximation. So you ignore the mass, and then you get that extraordinarily constrained picture. That argument that you can ignore the mass at high energies is almost right, but not quite. And here's, a, uh, here's where you see where the problem comes in when you have particles that have a spin. So let's we, say we go back to this W particle, which has a spin one. <clears throat> There's a qualitative difference between the number of degrees of freedom of a massive spin one particle compared to a massless spin one particle. A massive spin one particle, no matter how it's traveling, you can go to a frame of reference where it's stopped and then whatever, however it's spinning, you can rotate your head and you can see it's spinning in all the directions. Okay? So a massive spin one particle has three degrees of freedom, but a massless spin one particle like a photon has only two degrees of freedom. It only has the spin in the direction that it's moving or opposite to the direction that it's moving, and you can never catch up with it because it's moving at the speed of light in order to be able to see that it has all three degrees of freedom. So see, this is very striking, and it's, again, it's relativity rearing its head, there's a discontinuous difference between massive and massless. So when we go to very high energies and we say, oh, we can neg neglect the masses of the particles, that can't quite be right because there's extra degrees of freedom that are there. There's a difference between massive and massless. But that, all that tells you is that you have to be able to assemble the massive particles that we see at, at very long distances or low energies. You have to be able to assemble the degrees of freedom that make up those massive particles in terms of consistently interacting massless particles when we go to very high energies. And that's what the Higgs is about. In fact, if you just take the particles that we know and love and just assume that we could extrapolate them up to very high energies, you just find, just counting on your fingers, that, that you're missing one degree of freedom. You can't do it without adding at least one degree of freedom. And that Higgs particle is a single degree of freedom that you must add in order to be able to smoothly interpolate between the physics of massive particles at very low energies and massless particles at high energies. So the Higgs fits perfectly into this story. And in fact, the discovery of the Higgs, which was discovered here at the Large Hadron Collider, um, is the picture, the aerial picture outside uh, Geneva. The, the LHC is now turning back on again. Now, uh, although when it discovered the Higgs uh, July 4th, uh, 2012, it had a little bit lower energy. But uh, it's 27 kilometers around. It collides protons at a velocity 0.999999 times the speed of light. It's probing distances a thousand times smaller than the atomic nucleus. Okay? And the LHC discovered the Higgs, just like almost all of us uh, expected it to, because of this inevitability that I, that I talked about. So it's a triumph for experiment. It's a triumph for theory. Um, and it's an indication that these general basic laws work. Right? Even though it took 50 years uh, for it to be experimentally confirmed, that this basic picture works. And what makes the Higgs so interesting is it really shows that the belief in basic principles ultimately pays off. And we can turn this zero, uh, spin zero particle that was red before into black. We've seen it now. 
Okay? So this is, this is the sort of thing that happens to us often in, in uh, theoretical physics. We're confronted with mysteries and problems, and we have such an incredibly tight structure that we're working with already. Everything is, uh, largely works so much already that if you want to change things in some way to attack puzzles that you don't yet understand, you're in an incredible straitjacket. You can't just imagine any old thing that you want. 99.9% uh, .9 of your life as a theoretical physicist is spent trying to come up with an idea and immediately seeing that it's wrong. And it's wrong because, not because it disagrees with some experiment someone is going to do tomorrow, but because it disagrees with the experiments that have been done up, up to now, which are encapsulated in these extremely rigid laws of relativity and quantum mechanics. Nonetheless, when we play within the rules, incredibly tight rules that we're allowed to play in, uh, it's possible to make progress, even if it takes 50 years for experiment to come along and, and verify it. Now, you'll notice there's something very interesting that's left here. Okay, so of all the things that nature can do, we've seen it do everything so far. Even this one we saw. This is the only one that's left. And that's something that people are looking for a lot right now. Okay? Uh, if we have particles, massless particles, or approximately massless particles of mass three halves, that's only possible if nature has something called supersymmetry, something many of you have probably heard about. <laughs> There's lots of reasons to be excited about supersymmetry, and people are continuing to look for it uh, at the LHC, and will probably continue to look for it uh, for many years to come um, uh, until, unt until it's found. But the biggest reason to be excited as a theoretical physicist is it's the last thing nature can do, compatible with these general great principles, that we have not yet seen it do. And uh, it seems very hard to believe that it makes use of everything else and it doesn't make use of this last thing that it is allowed uh, to do. Okay, so, <clears throat> so that's really a review of, uh, of, of what we know so far. And uh, given the time, perhaps we will uh, talk more about what these frontiers are uh, as you bring them up in questions, but I'll just, uh, just flash them very quickly before ending. The two main frontiers I've talked about already, one of them is that this notion of space-time is doomed and something has got to replace it, and uh, this is, this is the, the subject where string theory has made uh, tremendous progress uh, and is the main, um, is the main uh, driver of, uh, of the questions that string theory uh, thinks about, so we'll hear more about it from Ashok uh, in, in his talk. Um, but there is another question, which is why is there a big macroscopic universe? Uh, and here it's also a very qualitative problem. The issue is that uh, because of the uncertainty principle, we expect violent quantum mechanical fluctuations, even in the vacuum of our, of our universe. Uh, and these fluctuations are larger and larger as you go to smaller and smaller distances. Now, in a world which has incredibly violent quantum fluctuation at incredibly tiny distances, it's a very big mystery why it seems homogeneous and you know, sort of more or less uniform on enormous scales. Okay? Uh, and it's a really big, very, very big question. Um, uh, by all rights, if we do a back-of-the-envelope estimate as theoretical physicists, and I, I won't go through this in, in any detail, if we do a back-of-the-envelope estimate um, for, for example, the amount of energy in the vacuum coming from these quantum mechanical fluctuations, then a back-of-the-envelope estimate would suggest that the universe is exploding and doubling in size every 10 to the minus 43 seconds, or it's curled up to minuscule size at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. And you look around, and it doesn't look like that. Okay? So we're not used to this. Theoretical physicists are used to making predictions that agree between theory and experiment, you know, sometimes to 12 decimal places, often routinely to three or four decimal places. Uh, if you're a decent theoretical physicist, you can estimate anything about the world and get it right to a factor of 10. If you're Enrico Fermi, to a factor of two. Okay? Uh, we're not used to getting things wrong by 10, 20, 60, 70, 120 orders of magnitude. But we do, and so, and it's, the, it's the trying to answer an incredibly basic question, why is the universe big? And at least some versions of this question, or answering some versions of this question, turn out to be closely connected to that same idea of supersymmetry I was telling you about before. All right, so, uh, so anyway, these are the really big questions. Uh, wh where space-time comes from, uh, and, and, and how we can have a macroscopic universe, and they both suggest that we're clearly missing something huge about the quantum mechanics of our relativistic vacuum. And let me just end by saying, so those are the big theoretical issues, but since we're talking about the future, I just want to give you some idea of the things that might be happening on the 20 or 30 year time scale. Uh, you know, if you guys are going into the field, these are going to be the sorts of experiments that might be relevant to your excitement. Um, people are already starting to plan for a generation of accelerators after the LHC. Uh, this is not been approved, people are just starting to talk about it now, but people are starting to seriously talk about this both in Europe and in China. 
Uh, to talk about an accelerator, it would be 100 kilometers around. That's you know, almost three, three and a half times bigger than the LHC, 10 times the energy of the LHC. And you know, if these things happen, they will start coming online 20 to 30 years from now. So that's the very short distance frontier. And on the very long distance frontier, we are looking at the properties of the universe and the pattern uh, that we see in the temperature coming from the cosmic microwave background. And that's going to tell us something about the properties of uh, the universe on the very longest scales and give us a window into incredibly early universe uh, cosmology. Many of these experiments have been, been done, amazing experiments over the last uh, 20 years, but they've given us, this is a picture of the observable universe, they've given us uh, a tiny little sliver out here. That's what we get from looking at the pattern of uh, the cosmic microwave background. And here's us in the middle. This is what we've seen just in the, uh, in the galaxies just around us. There's an incredible amount of the universe that we still haven't even seen or probed experimentally. Uh, the next 20 or 30 years are going to be about looking in there, seeing what's there, and, and using it to get an en enormous amount of extra information that will help us understand much more about what happened at incredibly high energy scales. So, um, so, so that's it for this uh, quick introduction. Uh, but it, it, it should be clear that it's an exhilarating time to be doing this kind of physics. It's very likely that the next steps, that's always what you have to do as a scientist, is think about what the next step is, not what you want to do, but what you have to do as the, as the next step. But it's likely that now we're at a point that the next step isn't just another little detail or two, but the next steps are likely more revolutionary. So I really hope some number of you, if not all of you, jump in. Thanks a lot.